Excellent. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome. Thank you for coming along. And thank you for asking me to, uh, to have a chat. Uh, my name is Simon Rao, and um, I'm, the, I'm the meteorologist for the British sailing team. Um, uh, and uh, my, main, my main job for them is to, is, to, is to help sailors and the coaches and the rest of the team prepare for the Olympics every few years. So um, I was very lucky and very fortunate to go out to Tokyo for the Olympics um, this last summer. Um, and in fact, I'm going out to Marseille tomorrow, um, which is on the south coast of France, and that's where the uh, sailing venue is, is being held for the for the um, 2024 Olympics, which are mainly being hosted in Paris. Um, anyway, I've got a few. I, I, I didn't come to be a meteorologist by the most direct route, so um, I've got a few slides and a few a few photos to show you. Um, I, I've I, I've always been in something vaguely technical and engineering and scientific. So uh, let, me, let me start from the beginning and um, I'll show you what's uh, going on. Right, okay, here we go. So after that utter bit of chaos there, um, I started off as, a, as an electrical engineer. Um, when I was at school, um, I was always uh, vaguely into maths and physics and stuff like that. So, so I tried to do the very boring route. I did maths, physics and chemistry at A-level um, and then went to study electrical engineering um, and I did electrical and electronic engineering um, and then went and joined the, the oil and gas business and spent seven pretty happy years, quite busy and quite quite interesting years on, on, on oil rigs. Uh, most of the time, I started off in the North Sea, um, well actually that's not really true, I, I, I got sent to uh, the southern part of Argentina um, to, to, for my initial training performance which is really interesting. Argentina is a very nice place. It's um, it's huge. It's just a, it's really big. The the, uh, the the landscape is big and the people are great. Um, uh, and then I came back and worked in the North Sea uh, on the on the on the oil rigs out there for about um, for about two three years. Um, and <laughs> I told my boss that because um, I worked for an international company, um, uh, I told my boss, well, for my next posting, I could really do with getting transferred to somewhere warm because December in the North Sea is is not awfully an awfully nice place to be. Um, and so I was lucky enough to be transferred to the desert in Oman, um, which, was, uh, which was really good. Now the job I was doing there was, was pretty interesting. Um, uh, if an oil company drills a, drills a well, uh, they need to know what's down there. Um, they'll have a reasonable idea from, from, from pre-drilling surveys and things like that. But the best way to actually find out what's in your oil well is to sling down, is to put down a selection of, of um, probes and just general measuring devices. And that's where we came in. We came along um, and we'd, uh, we'd drop, we'd drop uh, instruments down the well. Now bear in mind that some of these wells were up to five kilometers deep. So it was pretty specialized equipment. Um, uh, and we'd, uh, we'd, 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 we'd tell the, we'd, we'd measure things like the density of the rock, the porosity, whether it had oil or gas or water in it. Um, I got to got to deal with uh, a bunch of explosive work as well, uh, um, which is also quite fun. Um, if you have to, you have to be you have to be well trained for that though. Um, and of course, for those of you, all of you are are, are involved in the sea cadets. So uh, when you actually come to the explosive part of being at sea in the navy, um, there's all sorts of procedures that you have to go through, and it's exactly the same on oil rigs. But um, when when you get it right, it's um, it'll, it all works well. And it's very useful. Um, so, so that was fun, and I, I did that for about seven years, and then decided that uh, that I should stop doing that because I'd stopped enjoying it. And I think this was a, the first big lesson that I learned that if you stop enjoying something, you should probably stop doing it. Um, uh, so, so I decided to learn how to go sailing, um, which is a fairly, fairly impulsive decision. So I went to the Isle of Wight uh, back in 1997, a long time ago, um, and learned to sail. Um, I, I did one of these uh, four month Yacht, um, yacht master courses. Um, I got my qualifications um, and then started sailing, um, first of all, smaller boats, 36, 40 footers, um, and then um, moved on to larger ones, 20 meter yachts, uh, and ended up skippering those for a while, um, which was a, which is also pretty good. Um, that was, that was great. Um, I, th that culminated really in me um, being asked to skipper one of the boats in the clip around the world race. Um, now that's 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 quite fun because back then the boats were sixty foot yachts. Um, uh, they're bigger now than the, the latest fleet; they're up to seventy foot now. But back then they were sixty footers, and we, as the name of the race uh, implies, we went around the world. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 
the the crew on that are all are all paying customers. So so you can you can you can sign up to the race um, with no selling expense whatsoever, and you get about a month's training before the race starts. Uh, then you head off um, and sail around the world with uh, lots of stops. Thank goodness. Um, but probably our longest race was across the Pacific from Hawaii to Japan, um, which took about four weeks. Uh, this is me obviously doing some in-depth navigational briefing. This was on the way up from looking at that chart from Brazil to New York. Um, uh, and I was just, the, the, the good thing about being at sea, one of the important things about being at sea, um, which is a good lesson for life, is that good communication is essential. Uh, so I found it really useful to actually get all the crew together once a day, at least, uh, and tell them exactly what was going on, um, get their input, find out what their ideas were if they weren't telling me already, um, and just keep everyone informed and involved, which is a, I think a really, really important thing to do, whatever you're doing. Um, so that went well. Um, but then after a while, oh, this is us coming into Japan on that trip. Um, that was in, the weather conditions were interesting then. We had probably 55 knots as a sustained wind speed gusting up to 60. So a nice force 10, force 11. Um, and we had way too much sail up. We were going very quickly. It was quite good fun. Um, but anyway, that all, it, it didn't end horribly. We just took enough sail down and carried on going reasonably slowly. But uh, that, was, that was good. Um, the race ended really well. Uh, we, 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 we won the whole thing overall, which is great. And we finished um, up in Liverpool. So uh, I have fond memories of Albert Docks in Liverpool. Um, and we had a massive party that night. It was great. Then I got involved in... Um, in, in, in uh, the management of, 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 uh, of sailing stuff. So um, uh, I went back to the UK Sailing Academy in Cowles and the Isle of Wight, it's a big sailing school there, the one I initially trained and then worked at. Um, and I was chief instructor on the yachting side of it there. And that was all very well. Um, but um, I started to get, felt that I wasn't, I was basically starting to get bored. I'm terrible when I get bored. Um, so I went back to university again. I went back to the University of Reading in 2009 to do, um, to do meteorology um, uh, because I didn't really think, think of this as a, as a career change. I thought of it as, a, as an extension of my sailing career, um, uh, which it was because of course, part of being a, uh, an ocean sailor or any type of sailor is that you have to have a really good idea of what, what the weather's doing. Um, how it's going to affect your boat, how it's going to affect the route of your boat, which way you take the boat. Because going, sailing across an ocean, it's not, it's not like it's not like say sailing from Portsmouth to the Isle of Wight, where you just point your boat and go. Um, uh, if you have a three or four thousand mile trip, um, you have much much room for manoeuvre. You can go a bit north, you can go a bit south um, to, to to pick the quickest and the best weather for your for your trip. So I went back to university and really enjoyed it. I had to I had to teach myself maths again. Um, I had to get up to about a little standard maths to to get back into the course, um, but I ha had a lot of fun. And then I um, uh, started doing forecasting for just sailors after that. And uh, I got into teaching as well, teaching weather. Um, uh, and and the, the the notes uh, 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 and ran, ran ran weather courses for 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 Royal Yachting Association yachtmaster instructors um, and uh, sailors and clubs and that. And then, however, purely by, purely by being in the right place at the right time and, um, and grabbing the opportunity. I was asked to try out to be the weatherman for the, uh, for the British sailing team, um, uh, which I joined back in 2015, beginning of 2015. Um, went out to Rio for the Olympics uh, back in 2016. Uh, that was great. Um, uh, we just got to be a top sailing nation there, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and have, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, I've carried on, carried on that role. Um, through Tokyo and hopefully moving forward into the Paris Olympics. Um, this was the sailing venue at Tokyo, um, looking out from the top of, um, of a big platform. And up. as a sailing venue, uh, Japan's really interesting because for every, if, if, you, if, if any of you are into dinghy sailing at all, um, whenever you go to an event, there's always this document called the sailing instructions, which tells you, tells you what's going on. And there's always something in there about the safety and um, uh, what to do in emergencies. Um, in Japan, because of where it is, it's on the edge of the Pacific. Uh, there's a massive, it's on a big, it's on a big earthquake and volcano belt. So, so, so I've taken this photo looking out across the bay from the top of, um, of what's called a tsunami platform, which is this dirty, great, really strong steel platform, which is, um, which is built so that if a tidal wave comes along, um, 
which does happen in Japan, uh, infrequently, thankfully, but it does happen. Um, you can, you basically run up to the top and you hope for, you hope that it washes underneath you. So, so this is the only this is the only venue that I've ever been to where where as part of the sailing instructions you have um, you have both a tsunami evacuation protocol and also a typhoon um, evacuation protocol because the Olympics happened in the middle of the um, of the typhoon season, which is perhaps not the cleverest time, but it's okay, we got lucky. Um, and we did we did great in, um, in these Olympics as well. This is um, because of COVID, we didn't have the normal um, group photos with everyone before and after the event. But this was um, this was Giles Scott who defended his uh, his gold medal. Um, Giles is quite a big lad because I'm six foot two. Giles is, is six foot six. So he's massive. And you see both of us are standing next to the lunch collection um, sign, which I think you can you can tell you can tell he eats the most lunch in the, in, in this photo. Um, uh, so you know, Giles, Giles defended his gold. Um, Hannah Mills and Elia McIntyre um, also got gold in the women's 470s. Um, excuse me. Uh, Dylan and Stuart were, got gold in the uh, the 49ers. Uh, Emma won bronze in the um, in the women's windsurfing, and uh, John and Anna got silver in the NACRA. So we were really pleased. The Team GB sailors did us proud, and uh, we ended up with the the top sailing nation um, uh, place, which is really our. As far as sailing with as a sport, that's what we were really after. So, so that's that's a brief history. Now, another thing which I've got more and more into over the last few years is a, is forecasting for ocean rowing boats. Um, uh, and as I always tell people who's, who, who who ask if I can help with with the weather forecasting and the routing for for an ocean row, there are much cheaper and easier ways to row across an ocean. This 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 man here, uh, Ian Rivers, um, he's just uh, become the first person to row single-handed from New York back to the UK. He stopped in, he stopped at the, at the Silly Isles um, uh, about a month ago. Uh, it took him 85 days to row across. He got capsized three times. His carbon fiber, fiber rubber, r rudder, which is just, you can see at the back of the boat there, snapped in half. He had to rebuild that. Um, uh, he hadn't he had really quite, quite dramatic uh, moments and days on that trip. And also just to make life more difficult for himself, he didn't use GPS. He, he navigated his way across using a, using a sextant and the calculation tables and the sun and the moon and the stars. Um, so it was great. So I worked with him on that. And that, that, was, that was a really good project, really good project. If you want to look it up to have a look, his name is Ian Rivers. And if you look up Row Sentinel, because um, uh, Ian was 29 years in the army, uh, 22 of which were in, um, uh, in the SAS. Um, and he was raising funds for uh, for the SAS charity, Rose Sentinel, oh, sorry, Sentinel um, and um, a hospice up in Hereford as well. And, and I, I find myself working for lots of different types of clients, mostly marine based. Um, occasionally I do work for television companies if they have, um, uh, for example, the island with Bear Grylls, they had a safety boat going there every day. So they wanted forecasts for, the, um, uh, for that. So that was quite interesting. I've done a few series of that. Um, I do a fair amount of work for um, helping people uh, on yachts. Um, uh, occasionally I do work for the large luxury yachts, yachts, super yachts. Um, and that's that's quite interesting, it's a different world. I was doing one last year and they they they, they sailed, oh, they motored back because it's a motor vessel um, from, uh, from Antigua to Gibraltar. And they had a three and a half hour stopover in Gibraltar and took in 125,000 liters of diesel. And just think of the next points on that, and then they went off to um to Palma, which was there again. So it's a very varied. It's a very varied career. Um, I think um in in general, uh, getting into the technical side of things, into engineering, into uh, uh, science or meteorology, whatever your thing is, is um uh, it's a good thing to do if 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 that's your bag, if 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 if, if, if that's what you enjoy doing. It's certainly very interesting. Um, you're always meeting different people. Um, you're you're into different circumstances all the time. Um, uh, I've perhaps not been the most sensible one when it comes to the financials in life uh, because I've been working for myself an awful lot as opposed to working for an organisation. Um, sensible stuff like pensions and all that are a bit higgledy piggledy, but it all it all works out in the end. Um, I think the important thing is. Uh, Whatever you decide to do, make sure it is what you decide to do, and you enjoy doing it, and then really work hard. Um, um, that way, that way, you'll you'll find that the harder you work, the luckier you get, um, and the more fun you have doing it. Um, anyway, sorry for the rather messy start there. Um, 
Uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether we're having questions now or at the end, but um, whenever we are, I'll be happy to answer anything that anybody wants to ask. Thanks very much. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, we'll probably do questions at the end, guys. Um, I'll just do a quick uh, couple of secs before I introduce our next speaker, Fran. Um, what I'm pleased to see is quite a few of you who, uh, in the chat, I recognise the names from those who have just recently completed their MET course with the Sea Cadets. So that's really good to see. Thank you very much. Um, as a, as uh, Simon said, he is the meteorologist for the British Olympic sailing team, and I'm very grateful for him to come along. I'm now going to hand you over to Francesca Allen. Uh, Francesca was on the uh, MET course in front of me at the Royal Navy's uh, school down in Devonport and is now working at the Naval Air Station at Cold Rose. But uh, I won't steal any more of her thunder. I will just quickly change over and try and get the screen to share for you. That's you can... Thanks, Paul. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Thanks, Simon. Obviously, I sat through your talk once before again, but it is just amazing to hear your story again. Um, and everything you're doing. It sounds so exciting. I'm really jealous. Um, I sort of wish that was my career. Maybe one day it will be. Who knows? Uh, but we'll just, there we go. The slides are coming up. Perfect. So I will crack on. Um, my name's Francesca Allen and I'm a lieutenant full time in the Royal Navy, uh, which is very similar to Paul. And I'm an HM officer. So that stands for hydrographics and meteorology. Um, hydrographics is a big posh word for surveying the seabed and meteorology is the big posh word for weather forecasting. Uh, but they put those two disciplines together because in the Navy's eyes, they're both science subjects um, and you are what's called an HM officer. Next slide, please. Yeah. So my job and um, the aspect that I do at the moment, whereas Paul is a hydrographic surveyor, I'm the more weather forecasting side of things and I do some oceanography as well. And um, I decided to do my job because it basically sounded really interesting and I knew that I had to earn, earn a living. Um, and I, I went into the Navy, a big part of it was because I knew it paid really well and it was quite reliable work. Um, so I did science GCSEs um, and in my A-levels I did geography and chemistry and French and I really liked geography and earth sciences, so the physical side of geography. And I then went to university and I did a degree in oceanography. And when I found out that the Navy did this kind of stuff as well, I thought it was too good to be true um, and I should definitely join up. Next slide, please. There's probably a few more slides that explain that. Yeah. So I went to university in Southampton and they've got the School of Ocean and Earth Science there. So it's the best place in the entire country, basically, to do oceanography. So I was really lucky to get in there with my A-level grades. Uh, worked really hard and thought, yep, this is where I want to be. And that's the building that I went to. So for three years, I worked in that building. Um, I studied oceanography in depth and we went out on that research vessel that you can see in the picture. Um, practicing how to be scientists and oceanographers. Next slide, please. Um, then I joined the Navy, so this is in 2010, so 11 years ago now, and our basic naval training for officers is here at this place called Britannia Royal Naval College, which is in Dartmouth in Devon. Um, some of you might have already heard of that place. So all naval officers go through this place to have their basic naval training, um, and then warfare officers stay a little bit longer and do a bit more. Um, so I went here, I lived here for a year, um, it's a beautiful looking place, um, they do make you work quite hard, we did a lot of marching, a lot of running around, but also a lot of academic subjects as well, um, and I still have really, really fond memories of being there, it was my home for a year, um, and I made some really good friends 10 years ago now who I'm still in touch with. Next slide please. Um, so then you do spend a year shore based to start off with your training and then eventually the Navy thinks it's quite a good idea to get you to actually go to sea and see how you find it. So my first bit of sea time was on this frigate here called HMS Kent and I was just a trainee so I spent about a year in total on HMS Kent and um, spending time with all the different departments. So there's a ship at sea, you can't just order your Asda supermarket delivery to come so you've got a whole batch of chefs and a whole batch of kitchens which are called galleys on board a ship. 
trip. Um, so I spent some time with them, learning how you feed 200 people, three meals a day, all that kind of stuff. And um, I spent time driving and navigating the ship. So I was on the bridge. And of course, I did the weather because at that point I was still pretty keen and knew what I wanted to do. So I volunteered to do the weather um, for all of my time as well. And mostly got it right. So that was OK. Next slide, please. I then went on to do my uh, MET or weather training. And this is not a picture of me, obviously, but this is a picture of some of the things that we learned to do. So we released a weather balloon. That's quite literally what it is. It's a balloon with some radio kit on the bottom of it. It expands and expands, it goes up into the air and it gives us data on the temperature and the humidity of the air above us. And from that, we can understand what the weather is going to do on the ground. Next slide, please. So after I'd done my basic HM training, which was in Plymouth, I went back to sea again and I spent some time on a survey ship. And this one here is the one that I spent the time on. So this was in about 2014 to 2016. And this is HMS Echo, which is one of the Navy survey ships, which you might have heard of. All sorts of kits. I'm sure, um, Paul, have you been on this ship as well? I've been most... on a... Ooh, am I muted? No, no, I can hear you. Oh, good. Um, I've been on a sister ship, Enterprise. Sister Enterprise is actually, they look exactly the same, they're just called two different things. Um, so I went with this ship all the way to Australia. I went to Singapore, went to Bahrain, spent some time in the Gulf. I went to the Mediterranean and the Red Sea as well. So loads of good times out and about on HMS Echo. Next slide, please. Then the next stage of my um, career was learning all about the oceanography. So oceanography is another discipline. It's quite literally the geography of the sea, but they tie it in with meteorology and hydrography, sorry, because it's another science. Um, and what we do in terms of oceanography is all about how submarines act, because like aircraft fly in the air and you need to know about weather, submarines act in the ocean. So you need to know about the oceanography. So I did some training that got me um, up to scratch on knowing all about what the ocean is like. Next slide, please. And then that brings us to my current job, really. Um, I work RNS Coldrose, which is an air base, but it's for the Navy and it's in Helston in Cornwall. And that's a picture there of one of our Merlin Mark II helicopters uh, with one of the pilots going out. And the building in the background there is the air traffic control tower where the Met Office sits. So I do weather forecasting for the helicopters that go out over both land and sea. Next slide, please. And I, um, I'm part of the team that collects data that goes into producing charts like this, which you'll recognise from BBC Weather or perhaps apps on your phone. And I use these charts and create my own version of these charts every day. So a similar, really similar product to what you guys might all recognise. Next slide, please. The other bit of what I do is I go out into schools and I talk to people like you. And the last time I had to do that, I talked about space. So that's, uh, there's probably just a couple of slides coming up now all about space. And you might be like, why is that relevant? But all of our weather is driven by the sun and the sun comes from space, obviously. The heat from the sun travels all the way to the earth over millions and millions of miles. And it's that heat from the sun that heats the earth that long story short drives our weather. And we use data that comes in from all of the satellites that orbit around the earth to build our weather picture. Next slide, please. Yeah, that's just one of those. If you're doing sort of GCSE geography or looking at earth science subjects, it's just a really nice graphic that ties in how weather or meteorology ties into space. And all of this technology that we've got now is developing more and more every single year. Next slide, please. Cool, so this slide is just all about the highlights of my job. So why do I think my job's really good? I get to travel places. I've been all the way to Australia on HMS Echo. I get paid really well and I have something called a pension, which Simon mentioned, um, even at my age is really quite important to start looking at that to provide for yourself in uh, your older age. My employment's really reliable. Unless I've been really naughty, I'm not about to get sacked. Um, and we're encouraged in the Navy to partake in sport and fitness, which is really important to me as well. I don't just want to sit at a desk all day. I really like the people that I work with, um, even Paul there, he's all right as well. Okay. Um, and I've had some amazing life experiences, as um, Simon has said as well, perhaps not quite as good going <laughs> to the Tokyo Olympics, but I've been to some good places and I've taken part in some amazing operations. I've got a really good level of experience as an operational forecaster for someone of my age. 
We get different postings every 18 months to two years, which I really like. It keeps things fresh. You never get bored and you get to do so many aspects of our job but within the same organisation. So that links into variety, really. Never get bored. Most of my days are different, let alone my weeks being different as well. It's a really good starter to employment. Um, being in the military, any of the military trades really in any army, RAF or Navy employment is a really good basis for any other work that you go on to do in the future. And it's unusual. Mostly people are really interested in what I do. And I really like that. Even 10 or 11 years in, I still really like talking about it, which I think means I made the right choice. Next slide, please. Got to be honest with you, there will be some downsides and I think it's fair to discuss those as well. And some of those are things like being away from friends and family for a couple of months at a time, being out at sea, you obviously can't just drive around and see your parents or whatever. That's hard, but I've got used to it. I went away for uni to start with from home, so I've never been like someone that has to be at home all the time. Um, Wi-Fi, so you can't just take out your phone and expect to connect to WhatsApp. They are developing that technology now, but there is a bit of a delay to start with. So it's back to kind of emails and using um, standard old phone, mobile phone telephony. What we do in the Navy for all aspects of it really is quite unpredictable. There's a lot of short notice changes. That's what you sign up to. Um, that has its downsides, but I actually think that's quite exciting. There's some pretty tough rules. You've got to sign up to those rules and agree to be in the right place, in the right time, in the right rig, which I'm sure you're all learning anyway. And if you can't deal with that, then the Navy's probably not for you. Uh, seasickness. So I get seasick. And I didn't really discover that um, until we went to see on HMS Kent. But it turns out I get over it after a couple of days and everything's fine again. Uh, the food, the food isn't perhaps as good as your mum will cook you. Um, it might be different, you might like it, but the food, especially after a couple of weeks on board a ship, you run out of fresh stuff. So just something to be aware of, it is a bit different. And it's hard work. I do night shifts, I do long weekend shifts. You know, the hours that we do and the type of work we do is hard, but that means it's really rewarding. And I still think it's a really worthwhile career. That's probably the last slide, but just click on and see. Yeah. So that's where I work at the moment, that's the places where I have worked and we work all over the world, that's why I put that last point there, but you guys probably already know that anyway. Next slide. Yeah, this is something that might link to your school curriculum at the moment or other things that you do with Sea Cadets. Um, so the Navy's got um, more and more of an impact and we're thinking, trying to be conscious about our impact on the environment, climate change, sustainability, all those things that you'll be talking quite a lot about in school at the moment. The Navy's got a real drive to do the same. So it's more to just reassure you on that. Environmental refugees, that might be a bit of an odd term for you guys, but Climate change is forcing people to move around the world. Um, areas where they might have lived before are becoming inhabitable due to climate change. And that's creating a movement of people across the world. The Navy helps in that. We do something called humanitarian and disaster relief. And that's a key point of what we do in peacetime. So we're not just war fighting. We do a lot of other stuff as well. Next slide, please. Oh, some more things I love about my job. What else have I put? Let's see. Yeah, so one of the key things I do is I talk to people about how many women are in the Navy, which is quite an important point. So there's only 10% women in the Navy, and it's similar in the RAF and the Army as well. We're still working towards getting a really good balance of male and female and all genders in the Navy. Um, but we've got a couple of groups that specifically are for women in the Navy, and I run one of those down at Cold Rose, and that's one of the favourite parts of my job, really. Next slide, please. That's me in a school in Penzance. So I go in to teach schools and I talk to you guys doing things like this. I love that aspect of my job and I think it's really cool. Next slide, please. And this is a slightly alternative way of thinking about things. So I talk to people that used to be in the Navy. Uh, this is a batch of people that used to work at Coldrose in the 1950s and the 1960s, just after the Second World War. And a couple of years ago, I talk, got to talk to them about their ideas, about um, how they used to work and how things have changed, which was really interesting. Next slide, please. That's the end of my bit. Um, we'll leave questions to the end, I think, for everybody. Um, but thanks for listening and yeah, have a think about your questions. Brilliant. Thanks, Fran. Um, so as Fran has already alluded to, I'm more a hydrographer, so I'll spend my time uh, surveying the oceans 
in fact, for those of you from Eastern area, I've just spent uh, three months up in the river Humber uh, surveying that. And we were actually working using Grimsby Sea Cadets as our office. Um, but uh, it's not just about surveying. Uh, part of my job, we were in the TAC, I was a what we call TAC HM. Um, I know Fran's done a bit of it as well. Um, and I was on the battle staff. So we're advising the war fighters how to use the weather to the best effect. Hide the ship inside the rain cloud so it doesn't get picked up on radar. Uh, where the submarine can put itself so that it can't be detected by sonars. And that's a lot of, um, the question will always be asked is, so what about your weather? How does that affect me? And what we find as we go deeper and deeper, and as you've had, those of you who've done the weather course, is that weather affects pretty much everything we do. From the moment we get up and look out the window and decide to, that we're going to put our big thick coat on, rather than just walk outside in a t-shirt, right to when we go back to bed again um, in the evening. So it affects everything we do and also a lot of employers. Um, supermarkets will watch the weather because the season, that will drive what goes in the seasonal aisle. They'll know that there's a heat wave coming and they'll start ordering in extra barbecues. Um, power companies, uh, particularly during the winter, when there's a storm coming, they know that everybody will be cranking up the central heating, so they'll be bringing extra uh, generators online. So weather does have a huge effect, even down to whether your mobile phone is buffering on the bus home from um, school. That's probably because there might be some weather effects on the on the mobile phone signal. So it gets everywhere. So at this point, um, if I could go back to Ben, who uh, is our question master, and um, just take us through the questions. Yeah, so if anyone's got any questions, there's down at the bottom of your screen, you'll have a Q&A section. I'm going to put them in there, and then the panel will be able to answer them. Oh, that's uh, quite a few, isn't it? Yeah, we've got one that's come in. Um, this will be for the two Royal Navy guys. Uh, do your postings every two years alternate between sea and shore base? Should I go with that one first, Paul, and then you can... Yeah, by all means. Yeah, so I've seen that one in the chat, and then the rough answer is yes, they do. That's what they try and do. Um, but the caveat to everything with the Navy is it depends, basically. So if there's a gap and it's another sea job and it has to be filled by someone, and then you might do two sea jobs in a row. Um, for me, my first two jobs were sea jobs. Um, so in your first couple of years of being a naval officer or naval rating, you'll quite often do back-to-back -back sea jobs um, because you need to get the time in and then the shore jobs come when you're a bit more further on. Uh, for my part, uh, yes, it has alternated uh, quite a bit. Um, my first three jobs in the Royal Navy after graduating, uh, I started out as a marine engineer and then eventually uh, became an officer and a warfare officer. Um, so they, they were ship-based, completing all my task force, working my way up through the ranks, and then shore-based again. And certainly as an officer, I've done three ships back-to-back, -back, um, then became a HM, um, sub-specialising. And uh, after doing the course, I went to the Scott, uh, ended up being the operations officer there then to Yeovilton to do my time in uh, Tower, which then prepared me for my TAC HM. And then I spent three years on the Mine Warfare Battle Staff. So we alternated six months in the Gulf, six months back in the UK, um, running the Mine Hunters. Uh, from there uh, to HMS Enterprise, the Ops Officer there. And now I'm shore based again with the mobile survey team based out of Plymouth, but we're going all over the uh, UK and when needed, uh, out to the Caribbean for hurricane relief or anywhere else that uh, in the world that requires surveyors to check the safety of navigation because ships running into rocks is, uh, makes for really bad press. Um, there's no other questions coming in yet, but I'll have one. Um, this would be for both sides as well. So we'll start with Simon. Um, if because obviously all the cadets are going to be between the ages of 12 to 16, some of them are going to be older. If you're interested within the civilian life, how would I go about joining as a neutrologist? You're on mute again. <laughs> right, 
There we go. Um, two, two main ways. You, you, to, to, to become a, a meteorologist, you need a meteorology degree because it's, um, it's, it's, it's a fairly complex subject. There's two ways of doing that, really. You can, you can actually um, do a three or a four year meteorology degree as a bachelor's. Um, or you could do um, you could do another science based um, degree, uh, anything from geography to engineering uh, to maths to physics to anything really, um, but science based, uh, and then do a one year uh, master's degree um, on top of that, which is basically the route that I, that I took. Um, uh, once you have that meteorology degree, then um, uh, what? Quite a few people do, who, um, who 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 do that from the UK, they'll go and work for a um, train train further uh, in practical forecasting um, in in an organisation, for example, like the Met Office, which is based in Exeter, um, uh, and then that, then go on from there. But really, to start with, uh, to to become uh, an operational meteorologist, you need to study meteorology uh, at university level in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, for the Royal Navy, how would I go about joining if I wanted to join in the Royal Navy? Fran, do you want to take this one? Yeah, yeah, okay. So it depends whether you want to be a rater or an officer, but the very first point of call is the Royal Navy website. So it sounds like a bit of a cop-out, but Google it. Um, the, the Royal Navy careers website will have all the latest up-to-date stuff um, there. And you get an interview with your careers office, so your local armed forces careers office, and they can give you the detail on the educational levels that you need to join at each. So generally to be an officer, you don't have to have gone to university, but you do have to have done A-levels or some sort of equi equivalent. Whereas to join as a rating, you need GCSEs in certain subjects and um, to a certain level. Um, but once you check you have all of that, it depends what specialisation you want to be. So when I joined as an HM officer, you had to have done a degree actually in a science. And um, so for me, I don't know geography, so I was absolutely fine. Um, and that really let me come across um, from being a plain old warfare officer to an HM officer. And that worked really well. But now the rules are different. For example, you only have to have done A-levels and then you can actually do a degree in meteorology within the Navy, within your training. Um, so my first bit of advice would really be to Google the Royal Navy Careers website and that gives you the majority of up-to-date information. I'll add on to that actually, Fran. Um, yeah. From my own experience, um, the, I wasn't academically gifted in any way, shape or form mm -hmm. uh, when I was at school. Um, and then it was actually the Royal Navy that gave me the opportunity um, through as a rating to work my way up and eventually get um, it was a degree in marine engineering at the time, but at the time I could then transfer and do the um, course through me, which was accredited with Plymouth University and ended up with a bachelor's uh, and a postgrad certificate uh, afterwards. So if you're not feeling academically inclined at the moment, there is ways if you want to make up for it later. But I have to say that that is a supply and demand thing. Um, at the time, I was one of the lucky few who managed to get through. Um, since then, I think that's closed at the moment. But if we have another glut and very short of meteorologists, then they, they may change the rule, change the goalposts again. As Fran says, always worth a chat with a careers advisor first. 